So once again, welcome all panelists and uh, those who are watching the program live to this first session on impact of climate change on rubber and potential changes in the geography of production. We have uh, five presentations. And now I see Dr. Philip Tyler is on board. So all the speakers are in place. Shall we start? All right. So as for the program, the first speaker is myself. I will spend about 10 minutes to make the presentation. Hope you are able to see the slides. So I will quickly go through the slides and then wait for your questions, comments, etc. Impact of climate change on rubber cultivation in India. The session outline is as follows. Climate change in rubber growing regions over the decades. Impact of climate change on rubber cultivation and strategies for adaptation to changed climate. Let us have a quick look at the changes in climate that has happened in the various rubber growing regions in India. Before coming to India, we know this part of the world from where most of natural rubber is produced is highly vulnerable to adverse effects of climate change. And in India, these are the places where rubber is grown. This is the traditional belt where temperature is more equatorial. This is the hot and dry belt. And this is the Northeast India where the temperatures can be very cold during winter. And in these different regions, let us quickly see how climate has changed over the years. This is a compilation of uh, temperature data that we have collected from the Rubber Research Institute campus at Kottayam, which is in the uh, traditional heartland of rubber cultivation in India. Okay, this curve here is the moving average of daily temperature between the period 1957 and the 61. And the red curve is the mean for the period 2015-2019. And it's very obvious that temperature has shot up. This is the mean daily maximum temperature. Over a period of roughly 60 years, we see mean temperature has gone up. And here it is the monthly average of the same data. You see the mean monthly temperature has gone up by almost 2.2 degrees Celsius over a period of 60 years. If you look at the mean maximum temperature, it has gone up by 2.6 degrees centigrade. And if you look at the mean minimum temperature, it has gone up by 1.7 degrees centigrade. As we all know, ambient temperature, the air temperature has got an immediate and direct impact on daily latex production. Climate warming has been happening in different parts of the traditional rubber growing belt. As you can see from these two graphs over the years, you see the temperature going up steadily up. This is how temperature has warmed up in the northeastern region. In this particular case, it is Agartala, that is in the northeastern state of Tripura, where the mean monthly maximum temperature has gone up between 2009 and 2018 as compared to 2069 and 2078. So this is the long term average and this is the more recent 10 year average where you see the temperature has gone up. Similar data we have from various places where rubber is grown in India. So in a nutshell, both T max and T minimum have gone up. Number of hot days and number of warm nights every month have gone up. Number of bright sunshine hours per day has gone up. 
so it has come down mean annual rainfall did not show any clear trend but rainfall distribution has become more unpredictable because of these changes in the temperature and rainfall pattern we have been witnessing occurrence of extreme weather events in the recent years both in terms of the frequency and severity of heavy rainfall events leading to floods heat waves droughts unexpected break in monsoon cyclonic storms etc climate warming has been perhaps the most uh, significant and most spectacular change that we have been noticing in the rubber growing regions uh, throughout the country and perhaps in other country as well temperature has been progressively warming by at the rate of 0 0.04 degrees celsius per year in the traditional regions and 0 0.024 degrees celsius per year in northeastern india and rainfall pattern has been changing in an unpredictable manner in the nr plantation belts of the country so what do these changes mean to rubber cultivation because of unpredictability in the in the monsoon rains we see sometimes the crop stand coming down or the survival percentage particularly in the first year going down because of unpredictability in the weather parameters the growth rate has slowed down tremendously and this has a direct impact on prolonging the gestation period because of severe weather events occurring particularly warming conditions productivity is generally coming down and there has been a shift in the climatically most favorable region for cultivating rubber in the country the rubber the natural rubber landscape of india is definitely witnessing significant changes there is a serious concern about new emerging pests and diseases thanks to changes in the weather parameters. This is a example of how we have made use of vegetation temperature condition index VTCI as a proxy measure to measure drought. The red color indicates drought and the green color indicates less drought as you can read from the legend here so this is the state of kerala where and uh, the particular district of tamil nadu where rubber is a major agricultural crop and you can see the red patches increasing in area meaning more areas are getting affected by drought now if these areas have very young rubber plantations sometimes the young plants will die will just dry like you see here and if there are mature plantations in this hot area then productivity will come down we have seen that even up to 18 percentage of young holdings life-saving irrigation has been given in the traditional area in recent years which has been unheard of maybe 10 12 years ago impact of climate warming is different in different and are growing regions in the country this is some very important lesson that we have learned maybe this has applications to other and are growing countries as well as climate warming continues more areas in northeast india may become suitable for growing rubber but traditional areas may become less suitable non-traditional areas like north Konkan and central india are likely to become extremely difficult for cultivating this crop but the silver lining is that more areas in northeast india where now we are focusing more on expanding rubber cultivation there is a possibility of getting more areas suitable for rubber cultivation this is a summary data based on our realized yield from the field based on mathematical modeling making use of 
existing data. This is not a prediction, but we made use of existing data to relate how much productivity was affected when temperature rose by one degree centigrade. We can see in Northeastern region when temperature rose by one degree centigrade, there was hardly any reduction in productivity. Whereas you see more traditional regions like Kerala, Central Kerala, for a unit degree increase in temperature, there has been a substantial reduction in productivity. This is based on actual data that we have collected from the field over the decades. Now this is a prediction for the future. The geography that we see here is entire Northeastern India. So we have China here, Myanmar here, Thailand, Indonesia, etc. down here. This is Northeastern India where we are now cultivating rubber. We made use of ecological niche modeling based on the principle of maximum entropy. And I don't want to go into the details of the ENM model, ecological niche modeling in this presentation for want of time. But you see the outcome, which is based on 19 weather parameters that are prevailing in the region as compared to the original habitat or center of origin of Hevia brasiliensis. As of 2015, the non-blue color area is the region where there is a greater probability of cultivating natural rubber. Come 2050, you see the non-blue colors, particularly the more reddish colors, you read from the legend here, the non-blue colors are expanding. Now blue color means the probability of occurrence of rubber in that region is zero. Red color means probability is definite, one. So in between color means there is you know, varying probability of expansion of rubber cultivation to that region. See, come 2050, and for a perennial tree crop like rubber, 2050 is not a long time into the future. You see, more areas may become better suited for growing rubber. I'm not showing the data, corresponding data for the traditional areas, where we see that best suited areas in the traditional areas will be shrinking, which means the rubber geography or the, the, the natural rubber landscape of the country is poised to see major changes in the coming decades thanks to, thanks to climate change. See, this is the maximum capacity for production of natural rubber in India, okay? This is historical data, maximum production potential. And this is the maximum potential production into the future according to the current replanting, new planting rates. But you see, the realized deals have been slightly below the maximum potential right now. And when the rubber prices were very high, the realized yield was well above the maximum potential because of over exploitation, etc. And our consumption has been rising. And NR consumption in India is definitely predicted to go up. For obvious reasons, I am not filling the gap here. There is a current one or two years because there is going to be a blip in consumption. So I don't want to predict the values here, but even by assuming 1% growth in natural rubber consumption in India, so this is the way our consumption is going to go up. Now 1% growth year over year in NR consumption in India is an underestimate. So I expect this to be somewhere there and thanks to climate change and impact of extreme weather events, maximum potential production or the capacity for production might shrink. Therefore, climate change will seriously dent the NR demand supply equation in the country in the coming years. We have already begun to see that happening. 
Coming to the last session of my talk, strategies for adaptation to climate change. Of course, we have to come up with agronomic practices that are climate resilient. We have data from India as well as from various countries to show that some amount of intercropping is good for rubber cultivation. That is because when the plants are very young and if they are exposed to severe drought or severe cold temperature, the prevailing highlight conditions will aggravate the stress. And there is beautiful science behind that, why light can be harmful to plants when they are experiencing environmental stress. So giving a partial shade through proper scientific intercropping is definitely a climate resilient agronomic practice. Mulching in mature plantations, either through natural mulch or through artificial mulching, you are conserving uh, soil moisture, which will help to mitigate uh, the adverse effects of climate change in young plantations. Allowing natural wheat fluoride to grow, particularly dicots, away from the rhizosphere in young plantations, we have enough data to show that that will help in conserving the physical, chemical, and biological properties of the soil, particularly the soil moisture holding capacity. Effective nutrient management, particularly through potassium nutrition, and of course, giving life-saving irrigation, which has have shown you some data, you know, can, uh, it has become a practice in at least 18 to 20 percentage of the small holdings in India and partial irrigation from 0.25 to 0.5 ETC, we have been able to mitigate, I mean, agronomically mitigate adverse effects. But I think the long shot, and we have already put our hands on this, is to develop climate resilient clones. For example, RRA 430 has got much better climate resilience capacity than RRA 105 or RRAM 600. So this is our strategy for using genomic markers to help in identifying or selecting climate resilient clones. You know, you look for fingerprint, fingerprint for ATP production, key enzymes in the rubber biosynthesis pathway, or key enzymes and genes associated with drought tolerance, cold tolerance, antioxidant capacity, protection of photosynthetic machinery, etc. For which the whole genome sequence data that, that we have produced in the recent years uh, would be a very, very uh, powerful and handy tool. And before I say thank you, I, I just want to say that uh, it's also important that we properly project the carbon sequestration potential of rubber plantations vis-a-vis -vis the uh, very powerful positive carbon footprint of synthetic rubber. But we have to have synthetic rubber, but we should not shy away from projecting the great impact of uh, rubber plantations in sequestering atmospheric carbon, uh, carbon dioxide and the possibility of uh, setting up a voluntary carbon market, uh, at least among the NR growing countries, and how best the CSR funds of uh, major uh, uh, rubber consuming industries, particularly the tire industries, can be channeled into the small holdings, uh, natural rubber plantations, which sequester huge quantities of carbon dioxide and thus mitigate climate change. Um, it is really gratifying to see that the efforts taken by IRRDB to begin with, and then uh, ANRPC and now IRST, and a host of other international agencies uh, uh, to look at climate change and its impact on natural rubber cultivation very seriously, and to come up with the adaptation and mitigation strategies. So thank you very much. May I hand over the, the mic to the host or shall I invite the next speaker? Vincent?
Yes, please, uh, uh, Dr. Jacob, please, please go, go ahead uh, with the, the lineup of speakers. Uh, uh, I... Okay. I think for, I mean, it will be more convenient if we invite the questions at the end of the session as it is given in the program. So I call upon um, uh, uh, Dr. Eric Gohe, Siraj, to give your presentation. Can you please uh, now start sharing your slides, please? Yes, thank you, Dr. James. Uh, I'm very honored to be a part of this workshop, and I say good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Huh? So I will present to say uh, uh, the presentation that we have prepared uh, with my colleagues of CIRAD, huh? Philippe, Ian, Regis, and Frédéric. And the title is Worldwide Climate Typologies of Rubber Tree Cultivation, Risk and Opportunities Linked to Climate Change. So first of all, uh, I want to stress uh, the importance of natural rubber uh, in, our, in our world. Uh, natural rubber is a green substitute to petrol. Uh, it's representing about 47% of the global elastomer market. And at the moment, there is no credible or sustainable substitution by other compounds uh, at the moment, uh, uh, because uh, natural rubber has the particularity to be uh, made mainly of cis polyisoprene when uh, all say the synthetic rubbers are mainly trans polyisoprene. And this uh, stereochemic uh, property uh, gives uh, specific properties to, na to the natural rubber, especially regarding the adhesive properties and the high resistance to physical constraints regarding pressure and heat. And so that's the reason why we say the natural rubber market at the moment is still uh, involved in uh, almost 70%, and uh, 75% for car, for tires. Uh, it, it is a major part of car radial tires, uh, of the truck plane and bulldozer tires. It's a major part of all the anti-vibration systems and the anti-seismic equipments. And the conclusion of that is that natural rubber is now a strategic material. Huh? Any natural rubber shortage will result in a civilization shock huh, regarding the freight and the transport disruption. Uh, and it's, uh, that's why it's very important huh, to anticipate any changes in production conditions and to adapt to it. And we are at the moment experiencing the COVID-19 crisis. Huh? Just an example, what would be the current world status in case of a natural rubber shortage resulting in fighters' operation description, uh, which, which will in, in, in induce a total description of international medical supplies for masks, for medicines, for respirators, and a total description of food supply and delivery. We cannot envisage that, so we have to adapt. The problem, as Dr. James has said, showing the real cases, that all the international panel for climate change scenarios forecast an increase in temperature, uh, both for temperature, minimum temperatures, maximum temperatures, mean temperatures, plus 2, plus 3.5 degrees before 2100. At the, at the same time, huh, it plans a relative stability of the total rainfall amount, but modifications of the rainfall display. Increased rainfall during the rainy season is likely. Decreased rainfall during the dry season is likely. Increased frequency of extreme events has already started. Storms, typhoons, winds, floods, and fog. And there is a major problem, which is the imprecise downscaling at local and regional levels. Dr. James showed that. It cannot be predicted precisely. Climate change will also raise the atmospheric CO2 concentrations. 
and the possible likely developments uh, of new pests and diseases. In brief, those new climatic conditions will impact. Uh, it's not cool impact, it will impact the biology and the physiology of the rubber tree with effects on growth, on yield, and even survival. Uh, in CIRAD, uh, in 2015, we proposed a climatic uh, a description of the main climate for rubber uh, cultivation with the possible climates uh, with temperature, um, average temperatures between 23 and 28 degrees. Uh, the rainfall should be above 1,100. The number of dry months should be below five, and the number of cold months should be below five. And from this, it is possible to discriminate between traditional and marginal climates. I do not detail. From these parameters, we can derive five climatic indices. One for temperature, one for rainfall, one for the dry season month, one for the cold season month, and one for thermic amplitude. And the, the, clim, com, the climatic compo, uh, uh, composite marginality index has been described by uh, ourselves and uh, has been taken over in Vietnam by Ngoc and Guyen in 2016 to describe four main climatic classes. Huh? One, traditional, warm and humid, and three, marginal, warm and dry, cold and humid, and cold and dry. Uh, from this typology, we could derive 20 different possible climates and five intensities of climatic marginality. What is very interesting there is that at the moment, so the, margin, the marginality for, has been described regarding temperature only for the cold climate. It's impossible at the moment to discriminate between traditional and marginal areas because of high temperature. Because the rubber tree has never been planted until now in areas with mean temp annual temperatures above 28 degrees. And so there is uncertainty. The possible effect of higher temperature, eh, which is planned by all IPCC climatic scenarios, on growth, on yield, and even survival of the rubber tree is therefore almost unknown. If we analyze this climatic typology and the decision tree based on those climatic indices, we have four main classes. The class one, which is the typical subtropical climate, or the warm and humid margin marginality levels from zero to two. There, you have zero to medium impact on growth and the yield. It covers above 90% of the current growing, growing, growing areas. The second class is the warm and dry climate. The level, marginality level increases from one to three. It gathers all the recent extensions to less favorable areas, less rainfall and longer dry seasons. And it results in little to severe impact on growth and yield. There you have the Côte d'Ivoire, the new development in the savannah, northeast Thailand, northwest Cambodia. The class three, cold and humid, marginality level increases from one to four. You have the recent extensions to a higher latitude or altitudes. The effect on the, on the rubber is little to this, very severe. Uh, it includes China, the Yunnan and the island areas, Brazil, the Sao Paulo area, India, Assam, and James just talked about it, the North Vietnam, the Northeast Cambodia, the Gabon, and the Southeast Cameroon. And finally, the class four, which is very, very marginal as it is cold and dry, and the marginality levels there are maximum because there is a trend to continental climate. You have the medium to very severe impact on growth and yield, and you can find it mainly on the, in Mato Grosso in Brazil or in some areas of North Thailand. If you apply this uh, com uh, composite climat uh, climatic marginality index in Cambodia to describe uh, uh, as an example the rubber production provinces, you see here the display of the composite marginality index. Uh, you have the class one climate, uh, warm and humid, uh, southwest, uh, the southwest where there is almost no climate climatic marginality, and the center and the southeast, which are a little bit more marginal because of longer dry season. You have the northwest of the country, uh, which is warm and dry. And you have finally the latest developments, which are cold and humid in the northeast in the provinces of Ratanakiri and Mondolkiri. And for this climate, 
who say we need the adaptation of the good agricultural practices and there will be a different incidence of climatic change depending on each region. The scenarios of IPCC increase, plan an increase in temperature from 2 degrees to 3.5 degrees, from 28 degrees now maximum now to 30 degrees and 31 degrees. And this is what we call the global warming. And under, and under these conditions, many questions arise. What will be the impact on the sustainability of the natural rubber production under a warmer and drier climate with increased temperature, increased contrast with between dry and wet seasons and longer dry seasons? What will be the impact on the current climatic classes? There is uncertainty. What is the reliability of the models to set up the future of GAPs? And what is the possible downscaling of the climate predictions at the local or regional level? The risk linked to increased temperatures, the behavior of the rubber tree under annual mean temperature above 28 degrees is currently unknown and unpredictable until no rubber tree has never been planted in areas where the temperature is above 28. What will be the impact on the growth? What will be the impact on the yield? What will be huh, the growth and adaptation of the rubber plants under these new coming high temperatures? And what will be the impact on the yield? Let's remind that the latex flow after tapping huh, is linked to the internal turbo pressure in the latex vessels. And this is the reason why all rubber planters tap at night or in the early morning when the daily temperature is the lowest and latex turbo pressure is the highest. What will happen if the temperature rates? Increase in air temperature will lead to higher VPD and altered stomatal conductance tree transpiration and water status. It will also affect photosynthesis, respiration, carbon allocations, and physiology of the latex vessels. Too high temperatures will increase the risk of water stress disorders like xylem embolism or cavitation, creating disruption in water uptake may have impact on the soil functioning and quality due to modifications of soil moisture and flora and fauna. As the latex production totally depends on carbohydrate availability and tree water status, as the latex itself is composed of about 60 to 65 percent of water, there are large uncertainty and knowledge gaps. And just an example to show you what can happen huh, when you have associated heat waves huh, and a very severe uh, water stress. This is observation of dieback and troic necrosis observed in the northeast of Thailand uh, in uh, 2005. Uh, so anticipating what we are uh, observing now in a more global way, uh, this is a risk. The risk increased to link to the increased contrast between seasons uh, will result in the lengthening of dry seasons to affect the immature growth. In fact, when you have no dry season in the north of Sumatra, for instance, you can open the trees at 4.5 to 5 years old. But when you have five months of dry season, you have to wait for nine years to reach the same, the same girth. Adaptation, as James mentioned, we need clones adapted to grow. We need to manage the planting techniques like mulching the soil coverage to maintain the soil moisture or to limit evaporation. The irrigation, I put a question mark on irrigation because usually when you need to irrigate, there is no water available or limited. And selected growth stocks for increased water use efficiency. And there will be other aspects linked to climate change and the frequency of extreme events as typhoons and causing wind damage on the left. Increased risk of flooding like we saw on the last years in the south of Thailand and also in Kerala last year and also increase in atmospheric CO2 consolidation, uh, as well as new diseases and pests. And you see here a, a plot of pestalotopsis, new disease uh, affected. So what will be the impact per class of climate? In the climatic class one, uh, which are covering 90% of the traditional areas, there is, as James mentioned, a risk of a positive progressive shift to class two. Huh? These areas may become warm and dry. And so there is an urgent need for research and adaptation of practices, the clones, the planting, the soil cover, the mulching, the irrigation, 
the stimulation display, the efficiency of agroforestry and cover crops must be assessed in these new conditions as the synergy competition, which is well known and described, can be uh, shifted to competition for water and nutrient subsects uh, in conditions of increased water stress and soil functioning too in a changing environment. The climatic class two, warm and dry, is likely the first affected if temperatures are higher than 28 degrees. Uh, they will be detrimental to rubber growth and production. The risk of increasing severity of dry seasons questions the future sustainability of rubber cultivation in those areas. James mentioned also this for the center uh, India uh, conditions. Adaptation of practices is unlikely to be able to solve the problems there. By contrast, the situation of class three and the cold and humid classes of class four, cold and dry, might improve the current class three cold and humid zones might even become the best areas for rubber cultivation if temperatures increase by two to three degrees. So there is a possible shift to class four warm and humid. Beware, this means, uh, must be very careful about this uh, regarding policy uh, of plantings. This might be a possible cause for land use change. It should be very well monitored, uh, associated with strict policies to avoid possible future land grabbing and deforestation as these areas are currently still mainly covered by forest. So this is the conclusion. I hope I am still in time. Setting up multidisciplinary research programs, associating grading, physiology, ecophysiology, technology, climatology, bioclimatology, and socioeconomics appear as a priority to guarantee the sustainability of the natural rubber supply chain in this context of global climate change in order to fill the numerous knowledge gaps and improve the downscaling reliability of the forecast at the local, local and regional levels to adapt the GIPs to the new growing conditions, technical packages, to generalize the adoption of the climate smart agriculture concept for climate change adaptation and mitigation, and to orient decision making and planting policies on scientifically sounding criteria. Together with the overall global challenge huh, of natural rubber, which is the labor shortage risk, it should be the absolute priority for all the agronomy and physiology research programs on rubber for the next decades. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, it's really, I love uh, listening to your talk. Um, well, I think I will reserve my comments for the Q&A session. Uh, I will uh, immediately go and call upon Philip Tyler. Philip, you may now share your uh, slides and go ahead, please. Okay, can you hear me? I have a problem with sound. sound. No. Uh, Eric, Good morning. You, you'll be giving the talk by Eric. No. I... Okay. You Please can start. hear me now? Yep, fine. Okay, thank you. Can you see the slide? Yes? I don't hear you. Okay, so I'm going on. So I'm going to present something that is uh, complementary to what have been shown before, because it's really the direct effect of uh, climate change and mostly temperature change on the on the, the rubber tree ecophysiology, the functioning of the tree. So this is a work common to the same team as before, plus Frederic Doe from IRD. So what do we know about uh, the impact of uh, climate change on rubber tree functioning? Actually, we know very little, almost nothing. Uh, if we talk about rubber, rubber ecophysiology and future climate, we need to know first, what will the climate be in the main producing areas? And for this, we can say that we have information as Dr. James has shown, but not enough. And I will detail why later. Then at the tree level, what will be the effects of higher temperature directly on carbon assimilation, because carbon assimilation is the base 
of tree growth and of course of rubber yield because rubber is made mostly of carbon. And for this, we have very little information about the direct effect of temperature on carbon assimilation at the tree level. Then what will be the effects of higher temperature on tree growth? We can have some information, but very little also on the direct uh, processes. Also, Dr. James has shown that there is likely a negative effect of higher temperature on tree growth. And the same for latex production. Statistically, we know that higher temperature is likely to have a detrimental effect on latex production. But how does it work and why and how can we predict this effect? We really need to have more information about this kind of uh, uh, parameters. And finally, the adaptation of rubber trees to water stress, as it has been shown before by Dr. James, and I think uh, other presentation later will talk about this also. We have some information, but still not enough to really know what will happen in the future. So about the, the main, the climate in the main processing areas, we know what the global climate will be. It's really uh, rather well known. The, we have several climate scenarios that are likely, but what we need to know is really to downscale these climate changes to the local climate if in every uh, natural rubber area. We have uh, available methodologies which are now quite uh, reliable and available. And in some areas, as Dr. James has shown, and also this presentation, this uh, sorry example of uh, Tsomer et al. in 2014 in the uh, Shishuangbana area, we have some, in, for some areas, quite good prediction of the future change in climate and how this will affect uh, rubber cultivation. For example, in Shishuangbana, which is, as you know, the, the uh, northern limit of rubber cultivation, the area favorable to rubber may expand. But we need to generalize this kind of, of uh, studies or to update them because it has been done for some areas, for example, in Thailand some years ago, but now we have better tools and we need really to apply these tools to each area with uh, appropriate uh, uh, methodologies. Now, if we go to the direct effect of uh, temperature on carbon assimilation, we have some knowledge at leaf scale. We know, you can see on, on this graph, that the temperature has a direct effect on maximum assimilation rate at leaf level. And if you go over the optimal temperature, which is about 28, you have a decrease, which is quite sharp. And more interestingly, we, we have methodologies to calculate what we call the photosynthetic parameters, the, the parameters that will uh, uh, allow us to estimate the uh, photosynthetic capacity in the future under different climate. From the, to the current parameters, we will be able to calculate the future parameters in higher temperature. But this is at the leaf level. And if we want to really uh, estimate what will happen on the whole tree or the whole plantation level, it's still a long way to go because we need to go from the leaf photosynthetic parameters to first take into consideration the stomatal conductance. And we know as it has been shown before that when the temperature increase, the vat vapor pressure deficit of the air increase, and this will very likely decrease the stomatal conductance. So decrease the gas exchange at the leaf level. And then we have to integrate this at the canopy and the plantation level. And you can see on the right hand side picture that the climate condition, the microclimate for the different leaves in the canopy of a tree are very different. So we really need to integrate this at this level. And we also should take into consideration the effect of phenology. It's likely that a higher temperature could shorten the lifespan of the leaves. And this will have a, a, a strong impact on the carbon balance. So, what can we do to, to move forward? We, we have two ways. First, we can use the data that we can get from flux towers, which measure actually the exchange of uh, CO2 and water and energy at the canopy and, and the plot level. We have done this, for example, in Thailand, in Cha Cheng Sao, together with Kasset South University and the Rubber Authority of Thailand. And from this, we can measure the, the what we call the primary production, that's it, that is, more or less the biomass accumulation. 
we can also measure over years the use of water and we can calculate the water use efficiency. And as we do this together with very accurate measurements of uh, climate data, we can there then use this to model, to, to model really the future behavior of trees using functional models that links the different function of carbon assimilation, water exchange, water regulation, and so on at the tree level. And we can expand this at the, the, the plot level. And for example, we have a model that we have been using for different plantations like sorry, eucalypt that can simulate water flux and CO2 flux at the, at the plot level. And we can do simulation under different scenarios. Uh, another kind of model that will be presented, uh, I think, tomorrow or this afternoon by Sergei Blagodatsky is the Lucia model, which is a more integrative model at the uh, larger scale. And it, I think it's the, this study, climbing the mountain fast, and fast but smart, is the most uh, uh, developed published study that has been done so far. And that can uh, yield some prediction about the future impact of climate change. However, uh, the next step will be also once we will know what will be the carbon assimilation at the tree and the plot level to understand how this carbon will be shared between the growth, between the reserves, between the, the maintenance of the tree, and of course, between the yield and the regeneration of latex. Because we know that only a share, only a part of the carbon that is assimilated will be available for latex regeneration. And we need to maintain the balance between growth, maintenance, and latex yield. And one way that is very promising is to use stable carbon isotopes that, like we have done with 13 CO2 to really trace the carbon from the photosynthesis to the latex. And we have done the first study about this last year, which was published this year. And we show that uh, a part of the carbon uh, used for regen regeneration of latex come from reserves and a part come from more recent photosynthesis. And this change with the season. So this will also change likely with the climate. So this kind of study combined with uh, uh, modeling is what we need to really understand what will be the direct impact of climate on yield and growth and, and uh, total carbon assimilation. And uh, the other direct effect of temperature on latex yield, as uh, Eric mentioned before, of course, that will likely impact the latex flow and uh, we know that the latex flow is higher when the temperature is, is uh, lower. And uh, maybe also a parameter that will be uh, important to look at is day and night differences. Uh, for example, uh, this paper published by a team from China showed that this day night difference in mean temperature may have a huge, uh, huge impact on latex yield. And uh, most predictions show that night temperature will increase more than day temperatures. And uh, finally, what will be really important regarding the, this topic is to make, uh, to have uh, multidisciplinary research combining the effect of climate change and also the effect of uh, tapping frequencies to take into account the shortage of manpower that will, uh, that is currently uh, coming in and to see how we can combine low tapping frequencies with uh, uh, adapting to climate change. Regarding the adaptation for water stress, as uh, uh, for example, Dr. Jacob has shown before, we have more knowledge because there have been uh, more than 40 years of studies of the adaptation of rubber to marginal areas. And this marginality is mostly uh, draw, uh, longer drought periods, particularly in India and also in Northeast Thailand. And what is interesting is that from a recent studies that we have done in Thailand with uh, some partners, there is an interesting uh, clonal variability in the, response to, in the response to water stress. And for example, this graph shows that the trees who are able to grow the, the, the more in the dry conditions are those who invest the more in canopy during the rainy season. Actually, they avoid the, the water stress by growing during the rainy season and by uh, being much less, much less active during the dry season. And also something that is very important to take into account 
is that we know that for the future climate, we will really have to, uh, to uh, distinguish the different impact of drought. We have to distinguish soil drought and atmospheric drought. For example, this graph shows, if you look at the, the cycle, that's the current evapotranspiration by the trees, the, so sorry, the, the potential and the measured one. And we see that when the potential uh, increase, the current uh, transpiration increase up to a certain limit. Above a certain limit, the trees strongly regulate evapotranspiration, uh, transpiration, sorry, even if there is water available in the soil. So it means that there is a strong regulation uh, to limit the water loss. And this is one reason why many models that we have currently overestimate the water use uh, in uh, rubber plantations. So as a conclusion, we have uh, little knowledge on the direct effect of climate change on, uh, on uh, rubber functioning. We know that there are potential risks of uh, adverse effects of climate change on growth, on survival of the young trees and also on yield. And we need really to have intensive research uh, on the large scale by many teams. So one really important topic is to improve the eco-physiological functions that are used in integrative models to really be able to forecast the behavior of the trees in the future climate. Because so far in most available models, the functions really describing the, the functioning of the trees are not detailed enough or without uh, enough information. So thank you, that is all. Oh, thank you very much, Philip. It was really lovely to see your uh flux tower data from Chichen Shao, which we together reviewed some time ago, um, and your suggestions about uh, how to have multidisciplinary research for uh, future research into impact of climate change. Now we will move on to Mr. Tajuddin Ismail, who will be talking on the impact of climate change on latex harvesting um, activities. Um, kindly share the slides, please. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning to some of you. Okay, my name is Tajuddin Ismail. And uh, this presentation is uh, actually a joint effort uh, by me and Dr. Eric Gohe from Sirat. So the title of our presentation is Impact of Climate Change on Latex Harvesting. So the objectives of this uh, Presentation is to share some information based on field observations and experience on the impact of climate change on latex harvesting activities and rubber yield. Provide some practical solutions on how to deal and cope with the issues and problems faced by rubber tapers and plantation owners. These are the main climate change issues affecting latex harvesting. The first one is intensity and amount of rainfall, the time of rainfall, the duration of rainfall. These are latex harvesting operations affected by climate change. The first one is time for commencement of tapping because when uh, tapping uh, comments, actually okay. it, it is decided by the condition of the rubber trees, whether it is wet or dry. So when there's in, there is interference by rain, the time of commencement of tapping has to be adjusted or changed. Climate change issues also affect latex dripping time, that is, uh, the latex dripping time is shortened when there is rain 
or when one of the three is not good or healthy. Thirdly, partial loss or total crop loss due to unexpected rain during or after tapping operation has completed. And this is common uh, in those days also, but lately this type of problem has become more complex and more difficult to handle in the field. That takes collection time. Okay, this is also have been uh, disrupted or has to be uh, adjusted due to the change in time of rain and also the duration of the rain. Total number of tapping days, of course, um, due to the uh, unpredicted rain, rainfall and due to the uh, different intensity now uh, in, in the rainfall pattern, the total number of tapping days seem to be less compared to uh, past years. Stimulation application, the time and frequency now has got to be adjusted to suit the weather pattern and also lately because of the leaf disease situation in a few countries like Thailand, Malaysia and uh, Indonesia, the simulation application has to be adjusted to the condition and health of the canopy or the rubber leaves. Effect of the disruptions on routine latex harvesting operations, again, this is delay in commencement of tapping time due to occurrence of abnormal and unpredicted rain. Delayed the latex collection time past midday when tapping commenced late. Well, this is not good in terms of uh, latex yield. Shorter latex dripping time when tapping comm is commenced late. Frequent partial or total crop loss when unexpected rainfall while tapping is still in progress or latex are still dripping into the cups. Reduction in the total number of normal tapping days due to rain interruption. These are the more uh, detailed uh, issues that are facing the smallholders uh, or the tappers uh, at the moment. Disruption of tapping activities by abnormal rainfall. The ideal time for rubber tapping to achieve good yield under normal climatic condition in most countries is after 10 p.m. at night till around 9 a.m. on the following day or the following morning. However, due to personal safety in some areas, they are not safe and practical reasons, most tapping operations, including latex collection, are carried out between 4 a.m. till 11 a.m. Now, in the past, tappers are able to set quite a standard and routine time for tapping and latex collection. But at present, this is no longer possible. A lot of adjustment in tapping time or tapping commencement and latex collection has to be made to suit the weather condition. During the past few years, tapping operations are often disrupted by an unexpected early morning, morning showers, causing partial or total loss of crop. Tappers had to adjust their tapping and latex collection time to avoid or reduce crop loss due to sudden showers, which are impossible to predict. Now, this is a new problem in uh, Southeast Asia countries, natural rubber producing countries. Outbreak of leaf disease causing serious secondary leaf fall triggered by climate change. In early 2018, Indonesia and Malaysia experienced severe secondary leaf fall due to fungus attack on rubber leaves by odium, polytotricum, and pestalotiopsis, resulting from increased rainfall causing significant reduction in canopy density and unhealthy leaves and subsequently reduction of rubber yield. Subsequently, in 2019 and 2020, India, Thailand and Sri Lanka also suffered similar bad experience. To date, the total area affected by the secondary leaf fall in the five NR-producing countries is estimated around 
400,000 hectare. Okay, this is a big area and this area can increase any time. This is a secondary leaf fall in Palembang, South Sumatra. The photo on the left is good canopy in January of 2020 after revolution. And normally this is a time when the yield pick up after the revolution with a new canopy. But in March of 2020, there was an attack of pestalotiopsis and we get poor canopy like this and the yield uh, drops. Now, this is the rainfall and normal yield trend in South Sumatra. If you look at the graph on the rainfall and uh, try to uh, fit it with the distribution of yield of rubber uh, from January to December, you can see the pattern of yield is almost similar to the pattern of rainfall. Okay, the, this is due to the development of the canopy after reforation, uh, after the uh, dry spell in July, August, and then there's an increase, slow increase in yield up to December, and, uh, re in, and normally January to June, we expect the optimum yield or the high productive months. Okay, this coincides with the distribution pattern of rainfall. But what happened in 2020, the rainfall uh, it was very high and there was very uh, uh, bad uh, secondary leaf fall causing very uh, uh, low yield during these uh, three months. That is from March to May. Okay, this is an example of Sorry, canopy condition in Pulau Belitung. Good canopy in January 2020, about 70 to 80% canopy density. But from March onwards, due to the pestaleotiopsis attack, we lost a lot of leaves, a lot of canopy, and the leaves are no longer uh, efficient in. Um, uh, photosynthesis and other uh, process producing the latex and you can see later the data the yield uh, goes down okay this uh, normal yield in blue normal yield pattern in 2017 before pestalotiopsis okay January increase in February further increase in March and then it only slowly drops, drops down in May, June, and July. But what happened in this year in 2020? In January, it was slightly higher than 2017. Okay, but it never catch up because from February to March, there was already attack of pestalotiopsis, and the reduction in canopy caused severe reduction in yield and the yield does not go beyond, much beyond 30 kilos per task uh, uh, per tapping in 2020. Okay, uh, this paper, uh, the, the second part of this presentation, I pass over to Dr. Eric Gohe. Can you please continue, Dr. Eric? Thank you, thank you, Pak. Can you, <coughs> can everybody hear me, yes? Pardon me? You can hear me, yes? Yes. yes. Okay. So uh, after Budin just presented the, ex the effect of the high rainfall huh, description on tapping, huh, I will focus you now on the over aspect of climate change due to lengthened dry seasons combined with higher temperature, and, uh, which will result in an increased contrast between season, huh, between the rainy season and the dry season. Can you shift to the next slide, Pak? Yes, lengthen the right seasons combined with higher temperature hmm, will result in increased contrast with, between seasons and it will result in a decrease in growth during the immature period and therefore in a delayed opening time, uh, which will reduce the economic efficiency of plantations and uh, will uh, induce a delayed return on invest investment. So for instance, you have a, 
a generic graph there showing the opening edge in years after tapping as a function of the dry season length huh, varying from zero to five months. Why zero to five months? In fact, in fact, it's because there is no example of a successful rubber cultivation when the dry season months are above five. Huh? So no rubber planted in areas where you have six months dry. And so the, the duration of the immature phase can be doubled huh? from 4.5 years when you have absolutely no water stress, for instance, North Sumatra, uh, 4.5 to 5 years at opening to 9 years old, sometimes even 10, when the dry season length increases from 0 to 5 months per year. Next slide. And the latex is a cytoplasm uh, composed of about 60% of water. Huh? So any factor limiting the water uptake, the decrease in rainfall, drought, increased temperature, resulting in a break of leaf transpiration by the tree, will have direct depressive effect on the latex yield. It will immediately result in a drop in latex regeneration capability, combined with increasing temperature and VPD. Leaf stomata closure will result in a blockage of all water transports. And there will be a strong and negative interaction with efficiency of stimulation in case of reduced tapping frequencies. Next. And for adaptation, huh, we will act on the, on the GAPs. Huh? So the annual tapping stop during wintering and dry month huh, should be lengthened when the dry season length and severity are increased. Usually we recommend two or three weeks to, huh, uh, of tapping stop under normal conditions when there is no water stress and when the conditions, climate, climate conditions are normal. Huh? And so we stop the tapping during the refolation time. But we have to recommend up to three months huh, we, uh, in extreme cases of water stress like is sun in the northeast of Thailand. And this will also huh, act on the reduction of intervals between stimulations in case of reduced tapping frequencies. And so for more details, you can refer to this paper on the effects of that different tapping rest period during wintering and summer months on dry rubber yield in the northeast of Thailand. Huh? We write it with Pissama Chantumar in Church and Seoul. The effect of global warming, the latex flow after tapping, and especially the duration of flow, is linked to the internal toggle pressure of the latex vessels. This is the reason why all rubber planters tap at night or in the early morning, when the daily temperature is the lowest and the latex toggle pressure is the highest, because of this negative relation between temperature and toggle. What will happen with the temperature rises by two or three degrees at the time of tapping. Effect of those coming high temperatures on yield are actually unknown at the moment, as the rubber tree has never been planted in such areas. But nothing good a priori. Huh? So there is urgent need for research and adaptation. Next. And regarding the latex physiology, stricto sensu, Overall increasing climatic stress due to increased temperature, increased water stress, will result in an increased susceptibility to oxidative stress of the latex systems. Uh, there will be a decrease of scavenger molecules, especially tiles and ascorbat contents in the latex, resulting in a decrease of membranes protection, the liquid will burst early, increasing the risk of latex instability, resulting in latex early coagulation, decreased duration of latex flow, and therefore decrease of the yield. And any disturbed water uptake may also result in TSC, DRC increase, disturbing the latex flow. So this is not very optimistic, but we have to adapt. Thank you very much for your adaptation, for your attention. Okay, thank you, Eric, uh, and that's the end of our presentation. Yes. Thank you very much, Tajuddin and Dorik. Um, that is highly informative. A lot of food for thought there, and uh, I'm sure we'll come back to the theme of climate change and uh, tapping activity in the Q&A session. Thank you once again. So let me now request uh, our uh, IRRDB Plant Protection License Officer, Nugan and Mia, pardon me for my pronunciation. Uh, you are going to talk on climate change, effect of diseases and pest outbreaks on rubber productivity. 
You may kindly share your slides now, please. Yeah. Good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Nguyen An Nghia from RI Vietnam. And also I am the liaison officer of IRDB Plant Protection Specialist Group. Today I would like to present a presentation entitled Impact of Climate Change on Disease and Pet Outbreak on Robert Tree. This one is just a little bit different from the uh, title you see in the agenda. Uh, you know, the climate change on our day is globally recognized fact. And the changing climate not only influences the crop growth and development, but also has very serious impact on the diversity and in the distribution incident, reproduction, growth, development, and phenology of disease and pests. And it is likely to alter stage and rates of development of the pathogen, modify horse resistance, and result in changes in the physiology of hot pathogen interaction. And it is expected that the range of many insects, diseases, will expand or change and new combination of pests and disease may emerge when current natural ecosystem respond to enter temperature and precipitation profile. And a plant design disease is the result of interaction among a susceptible hot plant, virulent pathogen, and the environment. And the changes in any of the components of the disease, triangle can dramatically affect the multitude of the disease expression in a given pathosystem. And it is not surprising that disease patterns have already changed and will continue to change in response to the effect of climate change on pathogen and heart. The weather parameters have an important role in the triggering and spreading pests and disease in natural rubber. It implies that climate change will modify patient of the rubber disease and pest distribution. It may increase or decrease the incidence of some disease and pests by changing the condition that would trigger an outbreak. Almost all pests and disease known to affect natural rubber have been existing since long ago. However, some of them that were minor in nature have become major link only in nursery occurring in major tree also. And change in severity and patient of occurring uh, have also been noted. And so some super disease uh, change their relatively important, such as Odium secondary leaf form, ONF, Corinus for leaf form, CNF. That were more severe under climate change. Phytotera of normal leaf form, PLF, occur in New Europe planting area where this disease had not been recorded. And recently, an expected disease uh, is a uh, Pestalo TFC form has occurred. On the odium leaf form, disease change in the rainfall, increasing temperature, mist, and high humidity can increase the incidence of the disease. And the odium leaf form can reduce yield up to 45%. Odium leaf form is a significant limiting factor for rubber production areas especially in high humidity area and the occurrence of uh, oreum leaf horn is increasing rapidly. Climate change is one reason for this because it increased the possibility of climatic condition 
that allow for epidemic level of audio audium lifon outbreak. Uh, the favorable weather condition for Coronaspora lifon is saturated humidity and high temperature uh, from 26 to 30 Celsius degree. So Coronaspora lifon usually occur and develop when weather has rain under hot condition such as at the end of dry season and beginning of rainy season. In Vietnam, Cornesphora lifon was first detected in 1999 and after 10 years it had broken out due to favorable weather conditions. And at that time, more than 20,000 hectares were affected. And now the weather conditions affected by global climate change as warmer temperatures, erratic rain is favorable condition for Coronaspora lifon recurrence. Nowadays, see Coronaspora lifon has emerged in almost rubber glowing area in Vietnam. And that disease become one of the most threatening diseases of rubber in Vietnam now and future. And the climate change also is one of the factors that contributed to the outbreak of a new disease, which was believed to be caused by Neofusicocum, and now could be due to Betalotiopsis, Collectoricum, and or some unknown fungi. And the first outbreak of the disease was from Indonesia and Malaysia in 20, and later it's become more serious in uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and up here in Sri Lanka, India, and Thailand. At the end of uh, 2019, the total infected area was above 520,000 hectares, in which Indonesia was over 387,000 hectares. Hectare. Malaysia was nearly 10,000 hectares. Thailand was 122, uh, 530 hectares, and Sri Lanka was around 10,000 hectares. And this disease severely affects the health of the rubber tree and uh, causing significant reduction in latex yield. I think uh, later we will have more information about the disease uh, by the presentation from uh, <coughs> Mr. Zudin and some other presenters from Indonesia. And uh, another aspect. Uh, rubber tree was also attacked by a variety of pests. Uh, several pests that have been found on rubber tree. However, only some pests that could significantly damage the tree, such as that mice, cockchafer fruit, spider mice, scale insect, bug feeding caterpillar, and mealybug. Although the pest incident on rubber tree is relatively low, it is also found to be on the rise because of warming temperature in recent years. In conclusion, climate change may alter the current scenario of diseases and pests on rubber tree, and these changes will certainly have effect on productivity, and therefore, studying the impact of climate change on important plant disease and pests is essential to minimize yield and quality losses having in the selection for strategy to work around problem. And in the dis disciplinary approach, uh, preferably by international programs, must be adopted to assess the effect of climate change on diseases and pests on rubber tree, and the complexity of the process involved and their relationship require communication between professional in the various area concern. Uh, that one is the finish of my presentation and thanks for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Uh, that was an interesting talk on how climate change and favorable weather conditions can have a direct impact on uh, diseases of natural rubber. So now the floor is open. Uh, we will take a few questions from the panelists or from the uh, attendees.
who would want like to go first Datuk, would you like to initiate the discussion, please? Uh, there is no, you don't receive any question, James, to re respond? Yeah, we can hear you, yes. Yeah, the, I think this first session, we are looking at the, more on the, the effect of growth, you know, the initial presentation, because uh, that one, the immaturity period is lengthened. For example, we have experience in certain parts of Vietnam where the trees maturity will go up to six, seven, or even eight years, you know, instead of the normal five and a half to six years. So that's one. And then in terms of the uh, production of latex, tapping, uh, obviously the tapping day is very important as what has been presented by Tajuddin there. If you don't get the, you, you know, because of the rainfall, then the number of tipping days reduce. So what the Malaysian government is doing is during this very heavy monsoon, they provide some subsidy to the smallholders because they cannot go out and tap. I think the experience in India, you have your rain gut, eh? but during the heavy monsoon, then you have the incidence of your abnormal leaf fall. It's about to begin now, I suppose. Is it James? Your, your monsoon, uh, season and then you get your abnormal leaf fall Patopsara? Well, we have, uh, we live with Phytophthora and some of our new clones, new generation clones have a reasonably good tolerance to Phytophthora because these clones are fast growing and they have a heavy uh, load of canopy. These, these clones invest a lot of its carbon, their carbon in, in the canopy. So even if we lose 10, 15 percentage of the canopy because of abnormal leaf fall caused by the fungus, um, our productivity will not be affected, number one. Number two, if the season is really bad, if there is repeated defoliation because of uh, uh, Phytothora or any other fungus, then we really have a problem. Therefore, as I was uh, you know, noting down in the chat box, uh, Developing genetic tolerance to diseases. We should be part of our agenda of developing climate resilient clones. Should be a major agenda. Because these days, uh, using even normal chemicals for uh, plant protection measures is becoming increasingly difficult because of environmental concerns. And on top of that, spraying rubber plantations, particularly mature rubber plantations, is a very, very expensive affair. May and I comment on that, uh, Mr. James? Because I think you have raised a very important uh, issue with, with regards to the breeding for disease resistance. Uh, I yep. think you are aware of our international clone exchange program. Yes. Yep. We this are yes. late in carrying out the trials. You know? It involves yep. some 49 yep. clones. And uh, from Michelin Sirat, we received some 12 clones and some Absolutely. have been distributed yep. and we are conducting the trials now because yep. this is very important. They have spent a lot of money breeding yes. clones resistant to South American leaf blight, yep. but the possibility of uh, having also resistance to other yep. diseases yep. is there, but we need to test uh, because the exchange program has not been fully implemented. So we are hoping that if countries uh, cooperate, settle this, then we can start our clone trials in the different regions. And it's not only for the disease resistance, it's also for the wood. Because ultimately, we have been breeding now for greater you know, density of the wood, which will go into the furniture industry. And obviously, uh, now we are planting in the marginal areas, you know, high altitude, and then the drought prone areas. So this will, um, the activities carried out by the RDB will assist the NR producing countries to select the desired clones. 
Yeah. I think that's all that I need to say, Dr. James. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, IRRDB deserves all uh, in appreciation and congratulation uh, for that great initiative uh, of multinational clone exchange, uh, including the, you know, about a dozen salt tolerant clones that we got from uh, through CIRAD. Now that is there in uh, most of our member institutes. That's a great initiative. And also before that, we had the wild jam blossoms also collected. Yeah. And now we are planning to get more wild jam blossoms, maybe from Colombia, Peru, or even from Brazil itself. That's great. So we have a large gene pool with us. So if we want to develop uh, disease tolerant clones, what is the science? What is the technology that we have to uh, go and develop climate resilient clones, including disease tolerant clones? Uh, temperature tolerant clones, relatively drought tolerant clones. We can't continue to rely on traditional breeding and selection because that is going to take anyway like 25 years. Hmm. A lot of field work, a lot of uh, uh, the manpower requirement, it is terribly expensive. And we can't wait for 25 years because climate change and the adverse effects we are now beginning to see. So how to, to cut the corners uh, and go for, you know, and fast forward the business of developing genetically tolerant clones or genetically more capable clones they can capable of producing high yield. That is a, an important uh, question the International uh, Natural Rubber R&D Fraternity will have to uh, examine in my view. Mr. Tajudi, would you like to say anything more on that? For you, Ganan, you want to add on to that? If not, we will now shift the focus away from the diseases to, um, you know, the initial, the, the cardinal issues like, you know, uh, extreme weather events becoming more and more powerful and more frequent, um, including, you know, prolonged drought conditions or unexpected rains. Unexpected rains, as uh, Mr. Tajuddin explained, and also Eric explained, you know, it will have a direct impact on our tapping activity. Yes, it's yes. Uh, I think it is very important now that the uh, breeding uh, will have to uh, uh, seriously look into the uh, uh, disease resistance under heavy rainfall. Okay. Uh, focus on that because that is the uh, the the heavy rainfall is the one that the uh, that uh, triggers the, uh, the 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 disease attack, uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, going to me personally. I think it is going to be a prolonged issue. Not it's not going to go off just like that. Okay, but uh, in the question I read just now, uh, there is a question on use of rain guard in those uh, areas affected by by uh, heavy rain and loss of uh, crop and loss of tapping days, okay? Now, specifically in Malaysia and in Indonesia, the uh, Rubber Research Institute have tried, you know, for the past maybe 20 years or more, introducing the rain guard to the smallholders, okay? But our problem was uh, mainly uh, cost of the material, cost of fixing, uh, the adhesive was not effective, and uh, the type of rain we have may be different from from uh, the success areas like Sri Lanka, Vietnam, and uh, uh, India, where they, they successfully used uh, rain guard. Okay, so uh, I think uh, uh, the research institute need to go, uh, look back into this, look uh, the R and D on the design of the rain guard, the material uh, they should be using, the adhesive. And of course, finally, the cost, the cost of fixing, the cost of material. And uh, again, another issue is you have to uh, relocate the rain guard after one cycle. Okay. So in the areas where we tried to uh, introduce this uh, in Indonesia and uh, Malaysia, this was the main problem. Okay. Uh, so uh, it, very important for, for Indonesia and uh, Malaysia to uh, look into the rain gut uh, issues to solve the loss of yield, loss of crop, loss of tapping days. 
I mean, rain guarding is a well proven technique because we had to live with, you know, prolonged monsoon for about four or five months. Therefore, this technique evolved and it is now a standard practice in small and large holdings. So rain guarding uh, per se is not a challenge, but implementing rain guarding, there can be logistic problems. Yes, uh, that is a real problem. Now, other than that, climate change and uh, the tapping or latex production, latex harvesting, um, as Eric and the Philip pointed out, uh, as also I was, I also mentioned that in my first talk, uh, high temperature and prolonged drought period. That can have a direct impact because we know that VPD, which is a function of humidity and temperature, will have a direct bearing on the, uh, the target potential of the latex bearing cells. So when the VPD is very high, naturally, of the least temperature is very high and humidity is very low, air is very dry and warm. And if you do the tapping, you know, your latex flow will be inhibited. So that would be a direct and immediate effect. And that is something, have we all quantified this effect in, in our different countries? Yes, we have quantified. In the traditional areas, it can be for one degree rise in temperature, roughly 10% reduction. But in the cold prone regions of Northeast India, for one degree rise in temperature, productivity does not go down. And I would extrapolate that to, you know, the sub-Himalayan conditions where rubber is being grown in, in, in China too. With one degree rise in temperature may be useful, may be beneficial for productivity. Also the areas congenial for growing rubber might be expanding thanks to regional climate warming in, in the now, you know, cold regions where rubber is being cultivated. Coming to uh, one of the fundamental issues of the species migrating with the climate change. And therefore we might see the natural rubber landscape of the world and our member countries, you know, uh, first getting changed. We know that is happening, not only for rubber. Most many tropical crops are now being increasingly cultivated in temperate or, you know, in the higher latitudes in the Northern hemisphere thanks to the warming conditions. Or along with these species, these crop species, uh, their pests and pathogens are also moving. So climate-induced uh, uh, migration of the species will not be limited to, to favorable uh, or beneficial crops alone. Other crops are also moving. The point is actually, and again, Eric and uh, uh, Philip also said that, you know, this agroclimatic zoning, Certain regions, uh, you know, which are now warm and humid may become increasingly more difficult for rubber cultivation. We need to have a good estimate of this. In India, we are now in the process of doing this, agroclimatically mapping, including using remote sensing satellite based web data. I think there is a great need for agencies such as IRST, NRPC, IRRDB, and other you know, organizations on the platform today to come together and make a realistic assessment about what are the potential changes in the natural rubber landscape in the next 20, 30, 40 years in relation to the various IPCC scenarios. One point about uh, uh, productivity, growth and productivity. Yes, if you have a prolonged uh, dry period and a hot period, immaturity period will be prolonged. I think uh, in one of the slides it is shown that from 4.5 years, I assume that is in Indonesia, it can be doubled to nine years. And then imagine already in, in, in India, it is seven years, you know, we don't want to prolong it to, you know, 10 years. Therefore, developing climate resilient clones that can tolerate adverse climatic conditions and grow fast mm -hmm. should be a prime uh, objective, I believe. Anybody from the panel to come in, please? Um, Dr. James. James, uh, I have a question for Eric, uh, Dr. James. James. Yes, Can you hear me? Can you hear yes, me, James? Yes, yes, please go yeah, ahead. Yeah. 
you know the uh, Eric showed uh, the slide during the severe flood in South Thailand, and I think the trees were you know quite submerged. We had a similar experience years ago in the south of, of uh, Johor, you know? and I just want to know from him. Uh, do the trees finally recover because the experience that we had three to four days of flooding this is the beauty of the rubber trees they managed to recover fully is this the same observation that he made in thailand south thailand and maybe also india you had a very bad flood also last year thank you i have to walk and see what Eric, you want to comment on yes. that uh, <clears throat> i have not precise data measured for for this but uh I, I never saw any mortality of rubber trees, huh? except when the flooding was prolonged for more than one month. Huh? So for, uh, say, for a, a few days, even a few weeks of flooding, huh? the tree recovered, no problem. The problem is, the main problem is that during this, this time, set tapping is totally interrupted. And this uh, occurs very often in South Thailand. In September and October, and last year it was just terrible in Kerala. But uh, the tree can recover, and the tree is, is quite. Uh, the, the problem of this is the repetition, especially in the flooding areas, the lowland areas, during the immature stage, because this totally stops the growth. But for the mature areas, before, yes, and before Eric, making the tree die because of flooding, it will uh, we will not see that. The trees uh, they won't die if the flooding is not too long, but they will shed leaves out of the normal season. And one issue is to know if they will shed leaves again in the normal season. So there, if they do this, they will shed leaves twice a year, and so they will use more resources to to renew the, the canopy, and that will uh, impact uh, likely the the, the yield. And so re repeated flooding may have an impact on, on, uh, on the tree, uh, not survival, but tree, tree growth and tree, tree yield for sure. And, and I would like also to comment about, uh, sorry, I, I removed the camera, about uh, what uh, James said, we need uh, sure to, to, to develop programs for breeding in the future to maybe try to cut the corners, as you say, but one uh, lesson that we, learn from the recent COVID uh, uh, emergence is that when we try to cut corners in, in science, we just go nowhere. Huh? All the researchers which try to cut corners to, to develop uh, fast uh, uh, treatments lead to really uh, just loss of, of time. So we need to cut corners, but with precaution and to respect the basic rules of science. That's very, very important. And another comment is that uh, apart from breeding, we really know also to forecast what will be the, the, the behavior of the trees that are currently planted. Because all the farmers who have their plantation, they're not going to change easily from one crop to another or one clone to another. So there are huge areas in, in, the, in the rubber planting uh, uh, countries where the climate is changing and the farmers have their trees planted, so we really need to forecast what will happen also to these currently planted areas for the, let's say, the next 10 years. Um, if I may uh, add to what Phil was saying, I was uh, looking at the distribution of uh, annual yield across months, you know, and we find that during the lean period, particularly in India, it is the dry season, the summer season, um, in the, the relative share is uh, becoming very small. Uh, in that case, I just wonder, you know, um, why don't we skip tapping during the, you know, the lean time so that you can save on the cost and give your giving rest to the trees? Mm -hmm. Because as uh, Philip said, existing plantations cannot be converted to something else all of a sudden. So we have to live with these plants. We have to live with climate change and we can't change the clone or the genetic materials suddenly, but what are the practices, agronomic practices, management practices? In a mature plantation, there is uh, very little that you can do by way of increasing growth by giving extra, extra fertilizer. Irrigating mature rubber plantation is almost out of question. 
So tapping uh, is one area where we can probably, uh, you know, do some fine tuning in terms of the time of tapping. I know at least one major plantation company in, in, in India uh, used to send the tappers to the field very early in the morning, to be as early as three o'clock in the morning. Uh, Dr. James, may, may I get your permission to respond to one of the questions that is in the drop box? It's addressed to me, maybe I can. Huh? Can on, you repeat? Uh, it's from Indonesia, I think. Okay. I can't see it, but it's something to do with intercropping and, uh, you know, having a, a combination of crops being planted. I think that's the direction we are going. Uh, the only thing for the immature period is quite easy to have your intercrops. But the combination that you have to choose for crops or for plant species, for example, there are areas that they put in forest species combined with the uh, rubber then you have to decide on when you do your your felling that means the forest species will also fell at the same time to facilitate the replanting so this is actually the area or the direction that we are going now and the rdb promotes this that means we have to go into the intercropping to supplement the income especially for smallholders where the maturity period might come after eight or nine years so they need to have some income so that that is one uh, direction that we are going then the other thing even mixed cropping mixed species uh, some they put fruit trees but the only problem is you have to do your felling unless it's planted in the avenue planting where you can still fell your rubber and uh, the, the other species remain so we have to find a very good uh, this mixed farming system thank you very much james sure uh, i just want to bring uh, the attention bring to the attention of the panelists two comments that are there uh, towards the end of the chat box. One is from Malaysia and the other one is from India, from Jacob, Dr. Jacob Matthew. Uh, they both say that, you know, their mature rubber trees uh, were flooded sometime in the past, but that did not affect the yield per se. I think uh, we have seen in the last couple of, uh, last two years we had flooding. Uh, because of flooding, you can't go and do the tapping. And if there is excess rainfall also, you have difficulties in going and tapping. But and excess rainfall will definitely have a bearing on phytophthora. But the direct effect of flooding on immediate yield doesn't seem to be very big. But the direct effect of a high temperature on yield is, you know, our, all our data clearly show that your carbon assimilation, growth rate, immediate flow rate, you know, uh, suppression in the daily yield that is there. I will also um, want to flag one, two comments made by Julio Algier, pardon me if my pronunciation is not correct, uh, uh, from Peru. One comment is, why not we have agroforestry system based on rubber in Peru? And another comment by the same person is, uh, uh, what will be your recommendation for countries in the Amazon where we have original rubber species under forest to start plantations in degraded, humid tropics areas. Harry, you want to comment on that? For that book, you want to comment? I guess you see those questions or comments in the chat box. In India, we are in the process of developing rubber-based agroforestry systems because our average size is only about an acre, 0.5 hectare, and uh, uh, the viability of uh, you know almost a million small holdings with a mean area of 0.5 hectare uh, is becoming a matter of serious concern, both from the point of production of rubber as well as uh, the, the survival of the small farmers. Therefore, how best we can incorporate um, other species, uh, particularly agroforestry systems or fruits and vegetables uh, is a major area of agronomic uh, research in India. 
So Julio, uh, uh, I share your views. I share the same sentiments. Uh, but you know, for historical reasons, rubber always had been grown as a monoculture, large estate crop, and now it is a smallholder crop. Uh, but rubber agronomy is fast uh, evolving. Dr. James, can, can I respond to uh, two issues raised just now? Please. Okay. Uh, number one is regarding rest tapping. Uh, during the low yield or the, the during the dry period, okay. So we uh, we have introduced this this uh, system to rest during the low yield for uh, especially for plantation because it is not under the low rubber price now the current of low rubber price it is not economical to tap. In fact, uh, the the plantation owner has got to subsidize. If the yield is uh, below uh, 12 kg per task per tapping, okay, under the current low rubber price in uh, in some parts of Indonesia, so it is now being practiced. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm, I I have discussed with a, a few plantations that they're going they're going to implement rest tapping uh, starting July August. Uh, okay, we have tried. Uh, I've tried so far, on, uh, I've convinced only, managed to convince only one plantation to start the last four years. And uh, happy to report that uh, after the tapping uh, is rested, the yield, uh, uh, when they recommence tapping in uh, October, uh, November, December, there is a surge in uh, yield you know, after the rest uh, tapping. In fact, they make back, they make back more than uh, what they lost if they continue tapping at the high cost of production. Okay, so uh, we hope to get, uh, you know, to get more people to, to go into this. Yeah. In fact, we, I, I have uh, two plantations uh, by July, August, they are going to uh, stop tapping because the rubber price has not improved and uh, they're going to start uh, resting uh, July, August. Okay, number one. Number two is uh, agroforestry system. Okay, uh, there is uh, quite abundant data on mixed cropping, integrated farming, and also uh, uh, different species, uh, including, including planting herbs together with rubber. Okay, so uh, uh, the, the publications are there at the Rubber Institute, Rubber Institute of Malaysia, or uh, Malaysian Rubber Board now. So uh, those interested, you can uh, write to Malaysian Rubber Board or go to their website and try to get those articles. They are quite uh, quite uh, extensive there. And also Indonesia had, has done quite a bit uh, of work on um, intercropping uh, uh, rubber with uh, various food crops and also herbs. Yeah, these, are, these are the two I want to uh, add. Thank you. Well, in most of uh, those studies, we have seen that the productivity of rubber was not up to the mark. So we don't want to compromise rubber production market, but at the same time, we want to incorporate other crops into the system, which calls for drastic changes in the way we look at rubber agronomy, including spacing. Including spacing, because that is something that we have not visited in the last 50 years at, at least. So we still believe in the rectangular or in the traditional uh, a square planting pattern, keeping about 500 trees per hectare, 500 to 550 per hectare. But how best the planting design can be altered in such a way that total rubber production from one hectare is not affected marketly, but at the same time, you are releasing more space, more land for bringing in more crops, which can intercept light and utilize the nutrient from the soil. That is something that probably, you know, rubber agronomists should uh, look into. Uh, coming back to Eric, Philip, and, uh, you know, myself, we three come from the, from similar streams of physiology. I myself is a small grower and last one year I did not tap. And I found for different reasons. And I found that, you know, um, the biomass has gone up. And when I resume the tapping during this season, I'm getting good yield, much better yield than what I would have normally got. So not tapping a tree, because that will uh, reduce our 
gaps in our supply. But that carbon is being used to put on more biomass, which will eventually result in producing more latex. Therefore, leaving the tree idle during the lean season may have a, a, a sensible physiological meaning, at least to experiment with. That way you will reduce the cost of production also. At the same time, you are giving opportunity for the tree to put more biomass. Any comment? Yes, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Any tapping rest will result in an accumulation of reserves which can be used afterwards. Yep. And as you increase the growth, yep. uh, in fact, uh, for the same harvest index, you get afterwards more latex. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, except that, uh, Dr. James, you're not the average rubber planter, so you can not tap your trees and have an income from another way. So that's the issue for the small holders who are really depending on the day-to-day -day production of latex. But it's sure that the way forward will likely be to have people who are doing rubber part-time and who will have other activities that can be on-farm, but also uh, out-farm. Maybe like working in a factory during the week and tapping the trees during the weekend. That could be one, 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 so one of the the, the ways the, the, the sector is going to move to. I, I have just one more comment uh, regarding the tapping stop. Huh? The tapping stop is a, is a commonly used, for instance, uh, practice in the, in the marginal areas. Huh? Uh, if you look at uh, Isan, huh, usually they stop the tapping in January to restart it only on the 15th of April or even 1st of May. And in fact, compared, huh, if you conduct experiments huh, with or without tapping stop or with different tapping stop durations, you, you notice that the annual, huh, the annual total yield is not modified. So in fact, in fact uh, it means that the productivity of each tapping during the rainy season is much better. Hmm? Is much better when you conduct a tapping stop that when you, you do not. Uh, so the, the adaptation is there on the, on the, on the recommendation of the accurate huh, length of this tapping stop. For instance, in Yunnan, in, uh, in China, in South, uh, South China, uh, tapping, tapping is stopped almost for four months in a year from 15 November huh, to uh, mid-April. Uh, why? Because the, the, dry, the, dry and, uh, the dry season there, and the wintering season coincides with also cold months, huh, which are very dangerous because the, the coagulation and the coagulation doesn't stop. And in fact, we can produce two tons there huh, by tapping only eight months in a year. So any, any tapping stop, huh, Say when it is correctly managed and associated to suitable uh, physiological background is beneficial uh, for the latex productivity at each tapping and can be recovered. Good. Um, I think uh, we have overshot by more than 10 minutes now and we have been advised to, to, to break now uh, from the host. So just to wrap up, uh, I think we had a very useful interaction. A lot of uh, R&D has happened in the field of uh, climate change and evolving climate resilient uh, genomic practices, climate resilient clones, climate and tapping, climate and uh, person diseases. Um, I think uh, uh, the efforts that we had taken in IRRDB and other places in the last 10, 15 years uh, have really gave us uh, good dividends. At least we have some baseline information as to what climate change is all about in, the, in our growing countries of the world. Now, uh, to conclude, see, we are now going through a very bad time throughout the world because of the COVID and you know, the supply chain disruptions, the lockdowns, you know, life is terrible uh, in many parts of the world. Economy is taking a big beating, almost in every country. Um, how do we relate this to climate change? I mean, I'm not saying that you know, COVID-19 is due to climate change, but the after effects of COVID-19, I would like to see as a harbinger of things to come 
uh, in the coming years or coming decades because of climate change. Imagine how climate change might impact Southeast Asian countries and how that can seriously derail the production and supply chain of natural rubber. It will have serious implications for livelihood of millions of people in this uh, highly populous region. And it will have serious implications on uh, uh, rubber industry, global rubber industry. And there cannot be a lockdown to escape from climate change. I think uh, we will consolidate uh, the discussions here and uh, we will then uh, give a list of recommendations and uh, major findings from the five presentations. So I thank all the panelists, all the speakers, and all the participants, and also the organizers, and hand over the program to the organizers. Thank you very much.